Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Shake Sales. Today we got Benny Rubin of Senders.co. Benny is an email deliverability expert that's been hiding under a bunch of rocks in a cave, but secretly been doing <laughs> a bunch of volume and, and working with all types of uh, B2B uh, clients since 2016. So I think you probably launched your service similar to when we launched our company. Um, I, I, I'm maybe, I think we might beat you on the number of emails, but you probably got more delivered. But anyways, what I want to talk about today <laughs> is email deliverability in 2024 sure. and beyond. So Benny, welcome. Sure. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And email deliverability is such a hot topic because people really struggle with it. And the reasons why they struggle oftentimes aren't their fault at all. They really followed best practices, at least they've tried. I think that it's one of those things where a lot of folks can claim expertise, but expertise itself is something that you can gain on your own. It starts with understanding what all the bits and pieces are and then figuring out how it comes together for your own org. What my company specializes in is helping pretty like higher volume senders, folks that are trying to send, let's say 800 to 4,000 or so emails per day. And they can't really go on the rabbit hole, down the rabbit hole themselves. They have to make sure that they would, you know, like stick the landing in a way. Because unlike much smaller businesses that might spend two to six weeks in a rabbit hole and that's like, okay, as you mm -hmm. know, so John, when you are running a growth business, wasting one or two cycles trying to figure things out is probably the most expensive thing on the planet in your world, right? Yeah. So what happens is folks come to us when they say, hey, we've spent a week or two trying to suss out what's going on or why we can't get to the volume we need or why our open rates are dropping or why this kind of weird thing is happening. Can you fix it? And we specialize in fixing it very quickly, very promptly and getting them back on their feet, building backup systems and all that kind of stuff. So if anything from this call, I want the folks listening to know that uh, the basics really, really matter. All that stuff that you read about the SPF, DMARC, DKIM, uh, keeping your list nice and clean, emailing your most engaged or potentially engaged people, first and foremost, all these things really do matter. And a lot of the work that we're doing, even when we're working with much larger companies, comes down to that, those kinds of core elements. Very interesting. I think like what most people think about what all the those acronyms you mentioned mm -hmm. after they have an issue, right? Right. Like, oh, I didn't do this. Whoops. And I scaled too fast. Is it possible from your experience, can you recover from like if you hit the like filters or you hit you start getting yeah. in spam? Can you recover? Have you seen that? Yes. Be undone? You you can recover. I think that folks get a little bit wrapped up in thinking that they're pulling a fast one on the internet, like they figured out some sort of magical hack. But really cold email is very, very fundamental. It's uh, going around the room and introducing yourself to people in your target market. That's, that's basically all you're doing. And the Federal Trade Commission, which is the governing body of, the, of trade for the United States, basically said, yeah, you can, you can send emails around introducing yourself. You can send emails around that, that tout your product or service. That's not mm -hmm. illegal. That's not something that you have to be uh, worried about. They give you some guidelines. So I recommend everyone go and check out what the government says you should do. And even if you're not in the United States, these things do matter. But it's not like it's illegal or like some big hack. You literally are using a tool like Mailshake or whatever you're using. And you're saying, you're in my target market. How can I get you interested in checking out what I'm working on? And like, that's yeah. that. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that the internet isn't a giant hammer looking to punish you for sending emails to people in your target market and introducing yourself. It's not designed for that. The internet is designed to try to get people that have actual nefarious purposes. They're scammers, they're spammers, they're spoofers, they're pretending to be someone else. They're trying to get you to you know, invest in their crypto scam or whatever. They're trying to get those people out of the inbox. They sometimes accidentally get you wrapped up in it because you inadvertently did a s action or a set of actions that made them think, wait a minute, something's weird. Let's punish this. Let's stop them. Mm -hmm. And all of the things you hear about and you read about on the Mailshake website when they're trying to encourage you to do things like check your SPF, check your DMARC, check your DKIM, check this, check that, is all these tools that have been put in place to make it so you don't look like a spammer or scammer. Right, like that's the sort of important yeah. 
aspects of these things. And then the, the truth is that time can heal domain issues. A lot of the blacklists and the block lists that are out there are time based in, you know, it'll be, you'll be on there for a certain amount of time, three months, one week, two weeks, whatever. And they, they recycle because the internet, there would be no domains left on the planet if every single company that got hit with a spam series of spam complaints or whatever had to shut themselves down and never turn on again. I guarantee that every major company you've ever heard of has had some sort of spam scare where all their emails started going to spam and they had to figure out how to get out. Yeah, fair enough. I think the, um, you know, one of the things I'd say in my mind that's changed uh, over the years is that like DKM SPF used to be and just setting up the foundation of mm. your email and domain identity used to be like this, like if you did it, you'd get a better deliverability rate than mm. everyone else. And then 2018, yeah. 19, 20 came around. And it's like, hold on, this is what you need to do to show up. Right. Yes. Um, so it's no, like the basics and the setup have to be there before you send. Right. But keep in mind, this isn't organic. This is human beings saying, Hey, let's ratchet up email security to make it harder for bad people to do bad things. Mm -hmm. Right. On a, on a very basic level, what, what are we really talking about when we talk about email authentication? And, and if you're listening to this and you're, and you're, uh, you know, half asleep by now, uh, if you are sending cold emails, you should make sure that your SPF, DMARC, and DKIM are beautiful, perfectly aligned. Don't copy and paste them from someone else's site because it's not going to be perfect from what you need. Get help getting it set up. It really does matter, even the most basic level of those settings. And the reason what's changed, Sujan, is that over time, the major recipients of email, the, the Googles and the Microsofts and the Yahoos and all these folks, have basically coordinated to say, hey, we're going to ratchet up the requirements for these things. And mm -hmm. we're seeing another major change coming in February where Google is saying, furthermore, we're going to expect you to have these things. And if you don't, based on rules that you all can read on Google's website and other places, we're going to punish you. And that's kind of new. Mm -hmm. so it's, that's it's what's understood changed. What's changing? What I'm changing is, the actual organizations that invent things like SPF, DMARC, and DKIM are further furthering their mission of making sure that all emails are authenticated. Mm -hmm. So that's it's not like an organic change, in a sense. It really is a, a coordinated effort to make email more secure, in a way. And so those changes, that's if I if I understand correctly, that's February timeframe. Mm -hmm. major it's applying to major email providers aka all the public ones well right? google google's the one who instigated it and you it seems like there's a pattern of other email service providers following google's lead in this yeah. or it could have been okay. it could have been precipitated by other changes that have already been decided but as far as i know uh google makes the announcement and then microsoft and yahoo and others said like yeah yeah we're 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 going to do We're sort of on board yeah. in the same way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, usually it's Microsoft doing something and Google follows or vice versa. Right. Yeah. And then the others. But I think for, along. before everyone like freaks out who listens to this, you should understand that the specific rules that they outlined are really for people who are emailing gmail.com users, mm -hmm. B2C market people, you know, doing consumer marketing and things like that. If you're a recruiter and you're emailing a lot of personal email addresses, probably you should care more than just mm -hmm. a regular SaaS person who's emailing, you know, marketing directors or something. And if you're a, a, a free trial SaaS, like you have a free trial or a free tier to your SaaS, a lot of people sign up for SaaS products, which you call PLG, like product led growth type companies, uh, people who want to sound fancy use acronyms like PLG, but basically free, tr free trial SaaS companies need to care about this a lot because a lot of folks, when they sign up for something, they want to try it. They just use their gmail.com account, not their work email. So if those pile up a lot, even though it's not cold, you could end up running afoul of their rules. And so we say, okay, they have rules, da, 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 da. what do the rules say? This leads back to the first part of this conversation. Lo and behold, they say, hey, you have to make sure your SPF, DMARC, and DKIM are on point, please. 
And they list a whole bunch of other stuff that you have to be aware of. And they give you a tool called Google Postmaster Tools, which is a way to help you figure out how much how many of your emails are being marked as spam. And they set some guidelines and things like that. But it all comes back to this like core stuff we're talking about. You know, what is email? What is email deliverability? It's very, very few elements. And that's why mm -hmm. it's so frustrating for a lot of folks. And that's why it's so confusing when they come to our team and they say, no, no, I get it. Domain health. Okay. I got it. We, we got that. It's fine. And they're like, okay, yeah. What else? <laughs> like, what yeah. are you guys going to do different? And it's like the, the devil really is in the details, you know? Yeah. So I think just to break it down to simple, right? Sure. Cause you, you've already, you break it down like, Hey, look, it's simple. Follow the rules that or, or the rules aren't changing. They're just being punished more. Right. And the volume. Sure. Yeah. If you're in email marketing, you have a lot of consumer emails or you've got like free trials or pretty much you're sending multiple emails a day for any, even a, a valid reason mm -hmm. is probably a concern. You probably, you know, if you're a PLG, guess what? You may want to focus on activation even more. Not that that's changing. It's always been the yeah, case. You, why, and, you, and you have all these other tricks at your disposal. Yeah. Maybe you get a little bit more sensitive with the way you're pounding your free trial users to upgrade yeah. or something. But really, it's following, it's setting, it's the basic principle. So, you know, a, a quick example of this is if you're a mailshake customer, all the stuff mm -hmm. you see in yellow and red when we tell you to set up your campaign, just make sure it's green. Like, don't. Yeah. Sure. You used to be able to skip a step and be, oh, I can figure this out later. Do not figure this out later, yeah. right? It just go. Now, yep. what I feel like here is the internet, and it's all what mighty wisdom, is making a way bigger deal out of this. Not that it's not a big deal, but everyone's like, oh, my God, the world is changing. Email's dead, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wait, hold on. This is what we're supposed been supposed to be doing for the last five years anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, okay. So I can't speak for the internet because the internet doesn't make sense to me either. <laughs> and also if you look at my LinkedIn, I also do a sky's falling style with my LinkedIn. So you could accuse me of being part of the same problem. Um, I think that people are right to be a little bit concerned and upset anytime Google makes an explicit change because we, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't know how young I look on this video with, with the touch up button clicked, but I was around when Google made a major change to search and people's businesses got flipped upside down. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They made a, an update and people's business, like, yeah, I don't remember which one, Panda, Penguin, like there was all these silly names, yeah. but they made some update. And I had friends that went from top of Google to bottom of Google. They went from all their traffic coming from SEO to none. And then I had mm -hmm. others that were flipped. Hey, we didn't invest a single penny in SEO. And now we're at the top of the search list. High fives and mm. entire companies were destroyed. So I think people are right to be, to take note when Google makes a big change. So that's, it's good to take note. I think that most folks haven't actually gone to Google's website and read and <laughs> just like ask themselves like, oh, do I follow these guidelines? Because if you're following their guidelines, you probably would calm down. Oh, clear guidelines. Okay. This makes sense. Yeah. The other side of this is a little bit different. And I think it's the main problem that a lot of folks that are listening are struggling with, which is they're combining two problems in one. Google is making announcements on who they're going to let email their Google mail users. But the problem that most B2B marketers face is Google suspending their accounts when they send too many or do something with their Google workspace accounts. So they plug a Google account into Mailshake and they start to send something happens and Google sends them a notice saying you're suspended. You have to click this button to reconnect your account. So we mm -hmm. have seen since 20, I think, I think well, my team started seeing it a lot in 2020 and that's why we mm -hmm. switched for us and all of our clients. We switched off of sending from Google completely. We don't send any emails from Google at all because Google was basically indicating, Hey, we don't want you doing this from here. Mm -hmm. So I think that, Google being as unclear as Google is, Google being yeah. as opaque as they are, Google sending that weird cryptic message, letting you know they suspended your account, but not really telling you what's up. That creates a lot of confusion and fear. Mm -hmm. And that confusion and fear gets mixed with the confusion and fear from a Google update change. And then that 
is where it really explodes into people's consciousness. But those are, I think those, they might be related in some way, but those issues are actually quite separate. The yeah. Google sending issue and the Google receiving issue. And that's actually a good point. So I, I want to just clarify for everyone watching and depend, you know, you, you might be an advanced deliverability. You might be a beginner. You might be sending your first campaign. There's two parts of deliverability. There's, there's the sending, which is your email being allowed to send, right? So when mm -hmm. you talk about Google suspending you, that's on the sending side, right? That's right. They've got spam filters and filters. Ultimately, my opinion is you need to mimic natural behavior, right? That's why all the tools in sales automation space have a timing buffer. They vary it. It's all sorts of like tricks you can do, right? Um, you know, Mailshake, we do a variable and, and we have like a, a system that kind of, if you're running into trouble, we slow it down. You know, we, we are dynamically adjusting stuff. Anyways, there's the mail recipient side. So your email goes out. I email Benny and Benny doesn't get my email. Mm. I might be in G and you have a Gmail account or a Google account. I might be in the Google's receiving spam filters, right? We know about the promotions tab, the inbox tab, you know, all that stuff. That's the basic stuff, but there might just be, uh, I've sent it's, it's a bad email. You marked me as spam before, sure. or maybe enough of other users marked me as spam. So can we talk about, so I think the sending side, follow the basic principles. There's, those aren't changing. They're just more critical and they're heavily going to be. Well, they might be changing. We don't, we don't really know. And also keep in mind, it's not evenly distributed. So that's another thing that drives everyone crazy. The yes. old domains, the people that have had a Google Workspace account for a long time, they can oftentimes send so many emails and it's great. And then the new guys, the new thing, that's the problem. You yeah. Um, we found that because we couldn't be, we needed to be consistent with our clients. We moved all sending off of Google, manage IP addresses, do all the stuff that's very advanced that we only recommend for companies that can really afford that level of maintenance. Um, but on the really other side- you're sending high volume, right? Though, like, it, it, like if you're sending 100,000 emails a month, you got to go to like go to Benny and go hire his. I would company say we we oftentimes have a lot. We have a lot of clients that send a lot less, but mm -hmm. they need the reliability of it. Mm -hmm. Or, I'm not sure how many folks listening work inside an org where, if Google suspends your account, it sends people all the way up to the CEO a notice. So that's the kind of level when that happens. Then folks will start to see it start to say, hey, we need to get a consultant in here to fix that we can't yeah. be doing this. And it doesn't yeah. matter if they're sending 40 emails a day or 400 emails a day or whatever. If that starts yeah. to happen, it gets a little dicey and they really need um, guys like us to come in. And I mean, we pull email apart. That's what we do. Domains, mm -hmm. IP addresses, DNS records, reverse engineering, all this stuff, build it back up, like do all the, this kind of nerdy stuff that's required if you really want to have this consistent. But you want mm -hmm. to speak specifically on email delivery on actually like on, what happens between yeah. after the email send and gets received. Yeah. It's like the most fascinating, well, it's the most fascinating stuff on the internet, I think, really. Because email itself is baked into the fabric of the internet. It's, it's like, a, it's right there with like web browsers and probably it predates web browsers. It's, it's unbelievable what these things are. You're, you have a system that, that takes some text and walks up to the edge of the internet and like tosses it in. And then all the different nodes of the internet receive it and pass it along to the right person. It's a protocol. The protocol is SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. It basically says what to do with email. Mm -hmm. So it was really easy to take advantage of this because I could walk up to the edge of the internet and say, I'm Bill Gates and I'm sending an email. And it would go, Bill Gates sent an email, okay, and pass it along, pass it along, pass it along. And then it would get to, uh, you know, the CEO of Bank of America's inbox and it would be like, Bill Gates sent you an email and now I deliver it. And it would be, you know, a picture of a monkey uh, asking for your bank account information or something. Like it, would di like yeah. it didn't so matter. Because it was open and everything got passed through because of this beautiful transfer protocol that's free for everyone to use. People who are delivering these emails start to say, okay, we need to put some sort of, we need to put some work in here to make sure that the emails are going to deliver actually are from where they say they are 
and they're they don't contain malware and they don't contain anything bad mm -hmm. but before they could implement all these things spammers really got into sending spam and then billions and billions of billions of email spam started to be sent all the time so then they had to ratchet things up very very quickly and then you end up with all these different layers quarantines and public blacklists private blacklists um different kinds of inboxing Quar like when someone in the email gets quarantined literally it is like it just it's waiting at the edge of the inbox and they don't know where to put it a spam filter is almost a win in some cases because it got somewhere so all these layers exist and they're all very opaque for a reason because they don't want to give information to spammers about how to get around them but mm -hmm. on a very very basic level they're not designed to filter out your design company email to a potential client saying hey we've worked with other uh, shoe brands like i'd love the chance to work with you they're not really designed to filter those things out mm -hmm. that makes they're really sense. designed yeah, so to filter out like really bad stuff the bad stuff right the, the obvious the spam the fraud i mean like wire just yeah. bad stuff right so and and so that's that's a really interesting point so from the sending side simple rules to follow guidelines on the receiving yeah, side you, try to be gangs. a human Try to be human, get all your emails authenticated, make sure all the lights are green in Mailshake or whatever system you're using. Use a lot of common sense. It's not a it's not an algo. Mm -hmm. It's not a it's Fair not a, a TikTok algorithm. Yeah. You can't like yeah. follow a guy, oh, this is how you get around spam filters. Like it that's just no. not how they yeah, work. Just, They're yeah. way more sophisticated than you are. Yeah. Way more sophisticated. They're they're looking at fingerprinting, they're looking at domains, they're looking at the path that emails came across. They're comparing things to other things. They're they're doing all the sophisticated to try to figure out if you are a bad actor or not. And it mm -hmm. makes some mistakes, but it tends to get things right. So from a recipient side, let's let's go just dig into it. What do you think are like kind of like in your mind, high highest to lowest criteria or like top, maybe some top criteria? Like for me, it's like reputation. Mm, yeah email body subject like the copy sure right yeah. and the similarity to other emails out there that that's, are being yeah, sent. I think that's yeah the so sort of you, general uniqueness yeah I, like i think that i think that when folks are doing their email when they're getting their email set up we see human delusion almost at its highest and I'm saying this with a smile. If you're just listening to this audio, I'm being a little bit dramatic. I, and Sujan, you've been in the same position too. I have weeks where I talk to 30 founders of companies, 30, mm -hmm. you know, just me alone. I have a whole team of people and whatever, but like, and I have another salesperson or whatever, but talk to 30. Not a week goes by where someone doesn't tell me that their product and service is totally unique. And literally earlier that day, I talked to someone else who told me the same exact thing for the same exact product. Sometimes it's three or four times a week, right? So yeah. you are not unique. However, there's something about what you're doing is unique. There is some unique selling proposition buried in what you're doing. And your job as a cold email person is to try to bring that to the front and not let other things distract from that. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. So no, totally. you find you and you have to you have to ask yourself over and over and over again, okay, if I'm a marketing director, why would I reply to this when I might get three or four emails that are somewhat similar from the outside? Mm -hmm. And what happens is the reputation is, as you said, if you're sending emails that don't sort of strike the right uniqueness or whatever, and we can talk about, I'm sure you have lots of guests that have all sorts of frameworks around how to write good cold emails. So we don't need to go too much into that. If the people receiving the email ignore them, your sending ratios get weird. And then the internet starts to say, maybe this shouldn't be delivered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so your reputation suffers. Then over time, your deliverability goes down and down and down. And the internet starts to think, okay, well, maybe this is spam. Maybe the reason why no one's opening it or clicking it or doing anything or replying to it is because it's actually bad. Fair enough. So yeah, the, that that can cause your deliverability to suffer over time, um, and oftentimes you're it, the cause of it. It doesn't have anything to do with mechanics of sending at all. I look at this stuff as like 
advertising campaigns, okay. right? If you have a shitty commercial on the Super Bowl, the highest watched thing ever, it has a shitty outcome. Period. Yeah. Sure. It, if you're if you're it's not clever, it didn't keep the attention. It feels and looks the same as everything else has been out there before. I guarantee you, it will not work. You might get a lot of you're going to get a lot of eyeballs, but versus you you figured out a unique thing to say, right? Good example is that I don't know. I'm not a big football person, but like one company did a QR code. If you're sure. awesome, okay. Great, friggin' amazing results. But the fifth company who did the QR code, mediocre results, right? So mm-hmm. one, copying over time has diminished returns. Number sure. two, standing out has great returns. Yeah. My point is like bad copy, bad USP, not putting enough time into all this stuff. Really, it goes down to if you have just bad ads, bad, yeah. you just wrote the wrong things on the ad or you didn't put enough time into it. No matter whatever else you do, it doesn't work. So if your user, if the person you're emailing is like, I don't care about this, or like they overlook it, even if they open it, that will ultimately fail. And so mm-hmm. to me, domain reputation, all these things are like technical things that matter. Mm-hmm. But like go spend six months figuring out your USP mm-hmm. and what is the trigger that makes people want to be like the urgency, yeah. right? So like my mind urgency yeah. of deliverability is there's a change, but not really. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I agree. I think I agree on a fundamental level. I feel that we're the, the extent that every, if you're listening to this and you have a, a business, there is something that your target market will respond to. And I'm not saying, you know, something angry or silly or whatever. I mean, value proposition oriented. I'm not, you know, mm-hmm. going like, you know, send them, tell them you're sending them a kilo of chocolate and put their address wrong and see if what happens. I'm not saying like silliness. I mean, like genuine thing, things. We see clients that are clients of ours that we handle their deliverability and we don't even get involved in the copy. Some of these people do have two, three, four, five, ten percent 10% reply rates. Some of them have 10% interested reply rates and we're not talking at low volumes. And I wish yeah. that my team could take credit for being the geniuses that invented those campaigns. But these are people that spent a lot of time testing at low volumes and figuring out what was, uh, you know, catnip for their audience. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times what, what the best things that work are you come up with them when you're thinking really hard about what's going on in the mind of your recipient when they're opening your email. So for example, I get all these emails, we all get them, that I'm sure you get them too, that are like, I helped a company similar to yours do blah. That's assuming that whatever parameter by which they're emailing me is the same parameter by which I'm thinking at that time. And that might resonate with some people, it doesn't resonate with me, but that's okay. That Mm -hmm. might be effective, but I'll give you a a concrete example because I want everyone to have some concrete example. Um, assuming SPF, DMARC, DKM, all these things are good, your domain health's good, you're not doing anything dumb, like all that things, all that stuff aside. It turns out that creative people like to see things. Is that a shocker to you? Not a shocker to you. Does that mean you attach a PDF? No. But that means that if you say, can I share over a, a, some of our best work? Can I show over, share over uh, a PDF of our most recent project we did with da-da-da, and we even designed da-da-da to do da-da-da with it? That person actually might be, yeah, I'd like to see that. That sounds cool because a creative director or a creative person looks at creative things. If you're right, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's such a simple example, but so often it's like, do you want to have a meeting with me? Well, I don't know if your work isn't that great. Why would I want to have a meeting with you? It's a very logical thing to ask. So I'm doing a little, you're doing a little game theory in your brain and you're asking yourself, what's actually interesting to this person? There's Mm -hmm. another class of people that are, uh, you know, like me, for example, I'm a founder of a company and I like to get attention because I'm on this podcast, you can tell, and I like people to hear what I'm saying. And then a small number of those people go, Hey, you know, this Benny guy, we should talk with him. And that's a win for me. So when people email cold email me and they say, Hey, we're doing, we have a podcast that's about da 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 da. Even if it's for a software that I'm not that interested in, 
I'll take the call. I'll take the call. I'll learn yeah. about their software. I'll do a, 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 a pre-interview to see if I'm a fit for their podcast. They got me. Yeah. Now I know about their software. Now I'm recommending to my ops person, hey, we should, maybe we should check out this new CRM tool. I'm going to be on their yeah. podcast next week, but it looks pretty good. Right? So yeah. that's a cold email. They know what their goal is with me. They want to get me to assess their product, but they're not offering me, do you want a demo? No, I don't really want a demo. Yeah. And so I think well, the reason I'm saying founders, that is just, yeah. No, 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 no. I was just going to, I was just going to try to tie in a bow, but yeah. I think you can So if you're a founder getting pitched a freaking demo or a meeting, never going to work. Like, do you want a meeting? If I told you, hey, Benny, come on my freaking podcast. I got 7,000. Uh, I got, you're going to get 7,000 listens. You, That'd be awesome. you might, that might be awesome. And we might have to have a meeting, but the outcome is I started with that. Right. Uh, one of the best things I've seen, like, you know, one of the things you were talking about, like, okay. Uh, and I want to, I want to wrap this up because uh, people sure, are yeah. probably fading and, or like they're either their heads explode or then, or no one's listening or watching right now. One of hey, the we other. like both outcomes. <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> um, but, but like, you could also be smart with the timing of stuff. So like, like right now, everyone's budget conscious. They want growth, sure, yeah. but you know, they want to maybe do it a faster way. So like sure. if you're pitching people, maybe that's the angle. It's time-based, right? It's, it's, it's a, it's a theme that's happening in the world, maybe the U S the world, what have you. Um, those are ways to kind of fit your thing in. But I like, I think the people who ask the question, ask questions in emails, one, their emails are shorter. And you're, in my opinion, you're more likely to get a response because it's a, like a yes, no, like I'm interested. Sometimes you're curious. Yeah. Yeah. But again, everyone listening has a different target audience. So generalized yeah. advice doesn't really work. For example, we've done a lot of emails into law firms. Well, your, your email can be very long. Why? Fair Lawyers enough. value their time, but they read very fast, which means if you have a product or service that aims at lawyers, Go into some detail. Tell them exactly why it's unique and why they should care. Once they start reading, I guarantee you they will not stop until the end. Right? Okay, cool. That's interesting advice. Well, try that as an A version and then do a B version that's so short. Yeah. Let's see what happens. It's yeah. got to be tested. I, I always like to tell the story because I think it's kind of funny. Um, a client uh, swore up and down that they, I thought they had a serious deliverability problem. I thought that something was weird going on. So we're digging into it and we're looking at other things. And I was like, you know what? Maybe you should try something different. And they're like, what should we try? I was like, why don't you write the email? Don't use any of the pros. Don't use the templates. Don't. And they wrote the worst cold email I've ever seen. It started literally with by way of introduction. And I was just like, oh, this is so awful. But you know, that email performed better than anything that pros wrote. And you know the reason why? Because it fit her personality and the people that she was emailing's personality because she had a good sense of what they expect from someone like her. Yeah. Does that make sense? So it, what I'm trying to say is that oftentimes people go to the templates online and they don't suit who they're emailing. Yeah. People tell sense. me all the time, oh, I can't email, we can't email uh, you know, these people in that way. I'm like, mm, okay, why not? And they're like, their explanation doesn't have to do with the people that they're emailing. It's like, oh, well, the email will get really long or really short, or it'll be, it'll come off as a little bit terse or a little bit there. I'm like, okay, well, if you know your market and you think that that's good for them, then why don't you try it? You know? So I think that a lot of this, a lot of conversations about email deliverability revert back to this, which is just like, well, are you doing the best thing you can with, the emails that you are getting sent and delivered. And then yeah. of course, when people crack the code and they really do need this guy, like, look, when we were sending hundred emails a day, we were getting, you know, two, three responses a day. It was amazing. But then things cratered. That's where guys like my company come into play because we restore your sending. We take over all the domains and all this other stuff we get. We make this much deeper, much more solid. And then you can go about doing the scaling in the way that you already know works. When yeah. folks come to us and they want to scale, but they haven't figured out a low volume. Yeah, it's like, you're like figure out what your business is. Yeah, yeah but it's that's a pre revenue that, startup. The, that's the fun part. That's yeah. the exciting part. That's why we all do this. Because figuring out how to get people interested in what you're working on and potentially pay you money for it, which 
you get to pay your team and grow a thing like that's that's fun you know absolutely well i think uh, it's fun but best. that's why we're here guys uh, anyways benny thank you so much for uh, we can talk all day long by the way about this i think um i think we're getting into you called it out like let's not go generalize advice because really people should be testing right and yeah. things counterintuitive is an approach um, or your voice to your customer works sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but where can people go to f- learn more, follow along, become customers? Yeah, sure. Um, I did a uh, a webinar with Mailshake uh, a few weeks ago that uh, co- covers a lot of detail in email sending and delivery and is a lot of fun. So if you if you want to check that out, that'd be cool. My name is Benny and my company is senders.co and my email is Benny at senders.co and that's cool. I also post on LinkedIn, feisty stuff, sometimes not so feisty stuff. So you can follow me on there if you'd like, or shoot me an email any way you'd like. Awesome, man. We can't wait uh, to do more stuff with you. Let's do it. Talk soon. Thanks.